Well, again, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to come before the Word of God and to bring Him worship through the studying and listening of God's Word. We have sang songs regarding our God, and now we get to uh, listen to Him, listen to the Lord Jesus Christ Himself as we are worshiping Him this morning. So if you will turn with me to Matthew. We have been in a series in Matthew observing the life of the Lord Jesus, and now we get to observe His final week before His crucifixion. We're in Matthew chapter 22, and specifically we're in verses 23 to 33, speaking on the topic of resurrection. It's a very, very interesting topic, and I pray that each one of us will learn much from today's discussion or today's message. Let's read this and let's pray. Matthew 22, verse 23 to 33, it says, The same day Sadducees came to him who say there is no resurrection. They asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers among us. First married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So to the second and the third, down to the seventh, and after them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. But Jesus answered them, you are wrong, because you know neither the scripture nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. As for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not God of the dead, but God of the living. When the crowd heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. It's by the word of prayer. Our Father, we are thankful for this morning and everything that you are showing us this morning through your word. We're thankful that we get to come worship you. We're thankful that we get to come have our hearts be transformed by you this morning. We know, Lord, that your word is a two-edged sword that cuts through the soul and the spirit. And we know, Lord, that it has the capability of doing so this morning to each one of us. We pray for conviction. We pray for joy. We pray for peace. We pray for everything that happens as a result of the Holy Spirit's work for us and in us this morning. Help us, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Eternity resides in the heart of man. I remember growing up, I was part of the Buddhist culture, and one of the things that we did in the Buddhist culture was to burn paper money. Or not real money, it's just money about a square size with a little um, silverish, silverish, goldish tint uh, paper in the middle, and you just burn them. The reason why you burn them is because this is the way that you would honor your ancestors. Uh, the theology or theology or the reason behind it was that once you burn this paper money, your ancestors would be passed away for a long time, would be able to use this paper money or this money that is supposedly mo- a paper, supposedly money in eternity or in whatever state they're in, the spiritual world they're in, um, they could use it. They could spend money or they spend whatever they need and, um, and that's the way which they're honored by. It's part of the Buddhist culture. In Buddhism, there is a certain sense of you honoring your parents, honoring your grandparents, honoring your ancestors in that because in the Buddhist culture, there is a sense of eternity. However, not just the Buddhists have a sense of eternity. Many other cultures also have a sense of eternity. Egyptians had a sense of eternity as well. They mummified mummify their bodies. The reason why they mummify their bodies is because they believed that they're going to use their bodies in eternity. You need to preserve it for eternity. The Greek culture have people put in coins within the mouth of the deceased. So if you're dead and your relatives who are burying you will put a coin inside of you and you could take that coin in your afterlife and give it to the man or the ghost that handles the ferry and that ghost will be able to carry you across the river into eternal life. That was the idea of eternity in the Grecian culture and certainly beyond there, there's many other different cultures that would speak of eternity. There are cultures that would bury the dog, bury the horses with them so that they would have a ride for eternity, have a companion eternity. Every single culture, religion before the Enlightenment spoke of eternity. Then after the Enlightenment, which is around the 16, 1700s, people begin to think, well, perhaps there's no eternity. Perhaps there is no future after we die perhaps we're just a bunch of dust that will dissipate into the rest of the earth people such as jefferson voltaire believed no miracles and they certainly did not believe in eternity so we're at this point in our lives after gone through thousands of years and after the enlightenment wondering what is eternity 
Are we going to make an eternity, and if, the eternity, if eternity actually exists? Are we sure of the methodology which we have that will guarantee our eternal future, or if we're just going to be a bunch of dust that will dissipate into the rest of the world? The Bible actually has clear answers. You see, every single culture has their own theology, every single culture has their own passed down uh, uh, oral traditions, but the Bible actually has been telling us about eternity for a very, very long time. Ever since the beginning. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says this, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He is the one who created everything. He is the one who, in who everything consists, and He is the one everything originates from. He is God. He made the planets, the stars, the moon, light, earth, animals, plants, everything in this world. And finally, He made man. He made man a little bit different, though. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, says, The Lord God formed the man from dust, from the ground, and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, that the man became a living being. Now, every single thing created was living, in the sense that if there are animals or plants that were living, but God did something special to man. He breathed into man. He breathed his life into man. He breathed his spirit into man. And because he breathed his spirit into man, he made man a little bit different. Man has a sense of eternity inside of him. Man wonders about eternity, and in fact, man will live for eternity. And that was the intent of God, for man to live eternally with God. However, there is a story, and this is what happened, man sinned against God. God told man that the moment that you sin against me, or the day that you sin against me, you will begin to die, you will die. So that's what Adam and did, Eve did. They sinned against God, and after that, their life began to have an ending to them didn't die in that day, but they will die one day after they die. If they don't have the mercy and the grace of God, they will enter into a place called eternal hell. So there was a sad day of which they sinned against God. But God in that day gave them some good news. Actually, the perfect good news. On the day which Adam and Eve sinned against God, there was a promise of a Savior, a serpent crusher, a seed of a woman who will come into this world through woman, and that person will crush Satan. That person would defeat sin and death. And throughout the New Testament, throughout the Old Testament, we find that person to be our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the one who would defeat sin and death. He came, lived a perfect life. He gave his perfect life unto you and me. He died on the cross to pay for the punishment of our sins. He rose again to show us that there's eternity to be found in him as our sins are paid for as our punishments are paid for, as our life has been transformed by Him, as He gives life to us. There's eternity in Christ. We get to live eternally with God, and Jesus Christ being the first person to resurrect from the dead showed us that. He's the first fruit of resurrection. So today, what we're going to see in Matthew chapter 22, verse 23 to 33 is this. We're going to see the certainty of resurrection as presented by the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to see the certainty of resurrection. In this world, many people have their different theories on resurrection, but we know that resurrection is certain as spoken by the Bible, and the Bible actually gives us a a, a clear way how we can be resurrected and to be with God for eternity, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to see two challenges, one challenge to, to resurrection and affirmation of the Word of God regarding resurrection here in this passage. First, we're going to see that resurrection is challenged by the world. Biblical resurrection is indeed challenged by the world. We're going to see this in verse 23 to 28. Let's read this together. Of Matthew chapter 22, verse 23, The same day Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. They asked him a question saying, Teacher, Moses said if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers among us. First Marion died, and having no other offspring, left his wife to his brother, and so to the second and third, down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. We read one more. And Jesus answered them, You are wrong, because you know neither the scripture nor the power of God. So in order for us to understand this conversation that Jesus is having with the Sadducees, we have to understand a little bit where Jesus is coming from. Jesus, throughout his ministries, had been demonstrating that he is God. He is eternal God because life was literally emanating from the Lord Jesus Christ. Wherever he went, he could heal. Wherever he went, he brought forth life. People had 
problems in their physical being. They had missing arms, missing legs. They can't walk. They're crippled. The eyes couldn't see. The mouth couldn't speak. The ears couldn't hear. They came to Jesus. Jesus healed them all. There was life emanating from the Lord Jesus Christ. People simply had to touch him. Right? You had the woman that touched Jesus. And for years and years, she, bear this, she bore this sickness of losing blood. And at that moment, she was completely healed. Life was emanating from Jesus Christ. But not only did Jesus came to heal people physically, his ultimate goal is that you be healed spiritually. See, a man is not just composed of physical body. We're composed of two elements, an inner being and an outer being. We have an inner being, which you might call soul or spirit, and an outer being, which is a physical body. And certainly Jesus can't heal the physical body, but he came to heal your inner being as well. In John Chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said these words to the crowd who was following him. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Certainly this is a promise. Physically, in a sense, when we get resurrected, we will never thirst. We will never hunger. This is also a promise that we will be resurrected in the spirit. See, our souls will be restored to God. When we're, when we're restored to God, we will be satisfied in our innermost being. We will not hunger in our innermost being. We will not thirst in our innermost being. And the day is coming which we will never ever hunger and thirst again because we will be with them forever in our resurrected bodies. That is a promise of Lord Jesus Christ. He will heal us both physically and spiritually. And he demonstrates that here in this world because he kept giving pictures and shadows of his perfect resurrecting power. And perhaps one of the most demonstrable power which he showed in this world was the healing of Nazareth, uh, Lazarus or the raising of the dead of Lazarus. This is not talked about in the Matthew account, but right before Jesus entered into Jerusalem, he went to Bethany and he healed Lazarus or he raised Lazarus from the dead. The story was this. Jesus was in another place. And then Mary and Martha knew that Lazarus was sick, so sent people to Jesus to ask Jesus to heal Lazarus. Come and heal Lazarus. The one you love is sick. Jesus waited a couple more days and said, you know what, I will wait. Because he has something planned. He's going to seek to glorify God and glorify himself in the situation. So Lazarus died. And Jesus came to Bethany. He came to Bethany and Martha came to Jesus and said, Lord, if you would only been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus answered her this in John chapter 11, verse 25, 26, saying this to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe in this? Martha said, yes. Many of you are thinking that too, yes. And Jesus went to the tomb, asked people to open up the tomb. People were wondering, what are you doing? This man's been dead. For four days, his body is thinking right now. No worries, open the tomb. The tomb was open. Jesus cried out, Lazarus, come out. At that moment, Lazarus came out, resurrected from the dead. Everybody knew this was a miracle. Lazarus had been proven dead. He's been dead for four days. He's been dead for a long time. People have embalmed him. People have went to his house and people have seen him not breathing. I mean, it's evident he was dead. Nobody, once the tomb was closed, nobody was bringing food into the tomb. Nobody was opening the tomb and closing the tomb. I mean, there was nothing going on like that. And so when Jesus said, Lazarus, come out, people knew that Lazarus had come back from the dead. And this man, Jesus Christ, had given Lazarus life. This was a demonstration of Jesus' miracle, demonstration of Jesus' power over life and death. And this definitely got people thinking, can this be the Messiah? This definitely is the Messiah. The town of Bethany was in an uproar. And remember, this is right before Jesus entered into Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 21. And then the triumphal entry happened. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And people were following him. Matthew doesn't talk about it, but one of the reasons why people follow him, crying out in Matthew chapter 21, verse 9, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. is because Lazarus just had been raised from the dead and they saw Jesus do it. They were following him, saying, this has got to be Messiah. This has got to be the one. This has got to be the God who came to the earth to give life to mankind. It's got to be the one who they're looking for. However, this was not cherished by all. 
We're going to see here, since Matthew chapter 21 to Matthew chapter 22, Jesus had been debating with people, fighting with the religious leaders of his time, because Jerusalem is a place filled with religious leaders, religious groups, and political groups, like it is today, right? Many religious groups and political groups gather in Jerusalem. It's the center of religious and political thinking. So he, brought, he, uh, he, was, he, he met up with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were challenging Jesus. Jesus gave the three parables, judgment parables against the Pharisees. The Pharisees hated Jesus because Pharisees believed in some kind of works-based salvation. They not believe that you're saved by mercy of God, grace of God alone. Jesus said, no, I don't desire sacrifice. I desire mercy. They did not believe in that, the Pharisees, that is. They believed in working out their own righteousness and presenting their own righteousness before God as if that was good enough. Jesus called out the hypocrisy. So you guys are just a bunch of hypocrites. So the Pharisees hated Jesus, and last week what we saw were the Herodians. Herodians were another group that gathered in Jerusalem. They had some kind of political power, some kind of political clout with Herod. They followed Herod, and Herod attached himself to Caesar. Now, Herod also hated Jesus because Herod hated John the Baptist. Herod had killed John the Baptist, and John the Baptist and Jesus were on the same page. And Jesus himself called Herod a fox. This is found in Luke chapter 13, verse 32. Go tell that fox. Criticize Herod. So Herod hated Jesus. Herodians also hated Jesus. Did not want Jesus to come into power. Now, today, we're going to see a third group. Another group that were also, that were also in the city of Jerusalem, and they were the Sadducees. So who are the Sadducees then? So beyond Pharisees and Herodians, are Sadducees. Well, the Sadducees are another group of people that were both religious and political. They were religious liberals, meaning that they only believed in the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Only five books of the Bible. Only the first five books. The liberals in that sense. They take God very lightly. They have some kind of religious leaning, but they're also political, meaning that they're the ones who actually connect the religious leaning of Jerusalem to Rome. The chief priests, the scribes, the people eventually all uh, up against Jesus and crucified him were Sadducees. The ones who put Paul in prison, the ruling council of Jerusalem were Sadducees, religious liberals that were ruling over the religious lives of Israel. They had a real problem with Jesus. The reason why that real problem with Jesus is because if Jesus claimed to be king, then, then, then they, their status before Rome will be affected. If people begin to follow Jesus as king, then what will the Sadducees' status before Rome? Sadducees want to maintain their power, so they want to resist Jesus and become king of the Jews. So they have real reasons why they don't want Jesus to become king. They have real reasons why they want to resist Jesus. And the resistance to Jesus is seen here in verse 23. We read this, it says, In the same day, Sadducees came to Jesus, who say that there is no resurrection. Now, they're going to challenge Jesus with a question, but with that challenge, you're going to find a little more who Sadducees are. Sadducees don't believe in resurrection. Say, why don't they believe in resurrection? I think there are two reasons. Well, their reason is that resurrection is not talked about in the first five books of the Bible, which it is. And Jesus will show me later on, resurrection is very, very clearly stated in Exodus. He will tell them that. But they don't believe in that because they think that it's not talked about in the Bible. In fact, they debate with the Pharisees on the topic of resurrection. They don't believe in resurrection, so why the Pharisees do. Ultimately, though, I do think that they don't believe in resurrection because they lived it up. They were the wealthy ones. They were the, the, the ones who have power. They're living lasciviously. They don't want a resurrection because of all the wrong things they've done. They just want to disappear after they die. They want to turn to dust, and that's it. So they don't want resurrection. So they debate with the Pharisees all the time, and they had a particular question they asked the Pharisees. They, every time they asked the question to the Pharisees, they stumped the Pharisees, and the Pharisees cannot answer the question. So they figured that if they ask Jesus the same question, well, Jesus will be stumped. And because of that, Jesus' credibility will be lessened, and they can get rid of Jesus, and so forth. And we see the question here in verse 24, where it says, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, this is called a liberal marriage. Liberal marriage is described in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5 through 6. I'll read this to you. It says this, If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed 
or secede to the name of the dead brother that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. So what's going on here? So what's the point of all this? So if your brother dies and your brother had a wife and had no children, it's your responsibility to marry your brother's wife if you're single. I want to qualify that because I'll explain that a little bit. Some people say, oh, this is a condonement toward polygamy. It's not. I'll tell you why later on. But why is it important for this marriage to happen? This marriage must happen because tribal identity is especially important to the land of Israel. This is how land are divided. It's how inheritance are divided. So you need to maintain tribal identity. If a tribe would just keep a tribe would just keep dwindling and dwindling and dwindling down out of, out of existence, then a lot of the laws of the Mosaic Covenant cannot be practiced. So tribal identity identity must be kept. But another reason, spiritual reason, why this must happen is because tribal identity is how Messiah will come about. The Messiah is supposed to come from the tribe of Judah. In order for the promises of God to come about, tribal identity must be in place. That's the reason. So you say, yes, well, what if the little brother is married or the bigger brother is married? What do I do? Well, they can pass on the responsibility to the next kinsman redeemer. So some people say, oh, this is a condomen of polygamy because you have a wife already, you have to marry another wife. No, it's not. Now the story happened in Ruth chapter 4, verse 4. There was a kinsman redeemer that's closer to Ruth, that can marry Ruth before Boaz. And the Boaz had to ask this person, will you take Ruth? And this person says, no, I will not. I don't want this responsibility. And Boaz said, I'll take it. So they passed on to Boaz. So it's not a condonement. It's not condoning polygamy. The person who's already married can keep passing it on to the next kinsman redeemer. So with that, okay, just everybody catch that because it's not really part of the point of the sermon, but I want to bring that about. So coming, coming back to the point, everything's biblical so far, right? Hey, we're going to go and uh, we're going to mention to you this, this um, requirement of liberal marriage. The brother of the deceased brother shall marry the deceased brother's wife in order to maintain a name for the deceased brother. But here's come, here comes a ridiculous scenario in verse 25 to 28. The scenario is this. Now there were seven brothers among us. Okay, they're saying that this is a real story, but it's not a real story. They're just making it up. Seven brothers among us. First married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother, and to the second and the third, down to the seventh, and after all the women died. In resurrection, therefore, of the seven whose wife will she be for they all had her it's a ridiculous situation they think they could trick jesus but first of all this is not going to happen if it happens we're going to call the da right we're going to call the police say hey, there's something happening here in this marriage right it's like people kept dying and they're married to this person but the, but this is this this is the question that they kept asking the pharisees the pharisees have no answer because they did not understand resurrection now jesus is going to give them an answer and answer because he knows what resurrection is like because the God over all resurrected or all souls that are in heaven, which is which prior prior before his incarnation. So he knows what life is like after people die. But he's gonna rebuke them first in verse 29. He says in verse 29, You are wrong, because you know neither scriptures nor the power of God. The Sadducees they only believe in the first five books of the Bible. And if they read the Psalms, right, Ecclesiastes, they would know that the Bible is actually really, really clear regarding resurrection. There is the God who created life. There's a God who all life is going to return to. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7 says this, The dust returns to the earth as it was. The Spirit returns to the God who gave it. it. Happens to everybody. Your body is going to die. You're going to return to the dust. And your spirit is going to return to God who gave you the Spirit. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 says the real, uh, uh, display the reality of those who are going to enter into eternity. It says this, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Everybody is going to face God. Those who are gods are going to experience salvation. They're going to wake up to everlasting life. And those who are not, who are not gods... Right? They can wake up to everlasting life. But those who are not God's, those who are not in God's mercy, in God's grace, are going to wake up to everlasting contempt. They're going to be judged. And God is one who has control over all. 
First Samuel chapter two verse six. The Lord, uh, verse six says, the Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down shield and raises up. He has the ability to bring someone into life. He has the ability to make someone exit out of life. And after they exit out of life, he has determining, uh, determining authority to determine where they're going to go, whether to hell or to heaven. God is the God who has power over life, and Scripture clearly, clearly displays it. Everybody must give accountability to God. Yeah. Now in this world, people also challenge resurrection like the Sadducees challenge resurrection because people don't want to face up to the reality that they'll be judged by God one day. People say, oh, there's no resurrection. I'm just going to die. If you're going to die, then you just eat and drink and do whatever you want and you just disappear. But that's not the reality. In fact, Scripture gives so many incidences what our experiences will be like in eternity. Some people say, oh, you're not going to face anything in eternity. Oh, you're not going to feel anything in eternity. Some people say, oh, you're going to reincarnate as something else. You're not going to remember much. There's a story in the Bible of a person's experience in hell. A person is called the rich man. In the story of rich man and Lazarus. You know what the experience is like? He remembers everything. He remembers too much. Almost. In Luke chapter 16, verse 24, he remembers that he once was able to drink. Right? He was thirsty. He wanted some water. He remembers the reality of water in hell. It's like, I could drink. Lazarus, can you come over here and dip your finger in some water and give it to me so I could drink? He remembers the reality of water, which he had experience of while he was here on earth. In Luke chapter 16, verse 25, he remembers that he had a good earthly life. Abraham reminded him, you had a good earthly life. And the man acknowledged that. He regrets that in his good earthly life, he didn't turn to God and his mercy and his grace, but he lived his life lasciviously for himself. Amen. In Luke chapter 16, verse 28, the rich man also remembers that he's got family members that don't know Jesus or don't know the Lord. Amen. And he regrets that. He tells Lazarus, can you please go send people, or everyone, can you please go send Lazarus, go and tell them. Lazarus, everyone said, no, they have the law, they have Moses. <laughs> yeah, so the man remembers everything. That's why hell is not just a place of burning, it's not a place of physical torment, it's also a place of emotional and spiritual torment because of the fact that you remember everything and that you could have turned away from your sin and turn to God and everything could have been changed and you had to think about that for eternity with gnashing and grinding of teeth it's a horrible place to be it's not a place that we need to be if you hear today's message because God has placed eternity in all of our hearts Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 says he has made everything beautiful in his time. Also he has put eternity, put eternity into the heart of man. The reason why all his religions and all his faith and all his consideration of eternity is even existing right in our conversation is because God made us eternal. You don't see cats and dogs talk about eternity. Of course animals talking about eternity. The reason why they don't is because they're not made in the image of God. We're made in the image of God, so we talk about eternity. However, the problem is that our perception of how we get to eternity is so flawed and so wrong that we're not going to get there. I've been working in a secular field for a very long time, for about 14 years. And I've seen a lot of people come and go. Okay, because I work in the same company for 14 years. A lot of people I work with are the people I work with for 14 years. And I've seen a lot of people come and go. Come and go meaning that, or maybe just go. I haven't seen them come. They're older than me. But I see them go to eternity. And I go to their funerals. When I go to their funerals and they're not believers, people always comfort themselves with the words that this person is in a better place. Say so this person, because he's a good person, because they did these good things, he's in a better place. How do you know? It's not true. They're not in the better place. Because they don't understand the truth of God and what God has told us in Scripture. He's not a good person. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says this, There's none who is good, not even one. There's no one who is good compared to the perfect, holy standard of God. If you want to get to heaven by your, old, by your good standards or by your good works, you will never ever get there. The only standard is God's standard. If you compare yourself to God's standard, then you are sinful 
and you deserve eternity in hell. And that's why we need Jesus Christ who lived the perfect life and died on the cross and rose again for us. Who gave his perfect righteousness to us. Who died on the cross to pay the punishment for our sins. Who rose again to show us that this is the way. He's not lying about it. He rose again to show us, hey, I've done it, so you can too. That is the promise of God. We have something absolute to depend upon when we consider resurrection, when we consider eternal life. We will be with God. That is the good promise of the Bible. So here, we see that resurrection is challenged by the world as we consider the certainty of resurrection. It is challenged by the world. But the next point, what we're going to see is this. It's affirmed by the word. Resurrection is clearly affirmed by the word. Let's read from verse 29 to 33. Verse 29. And Jesus answered them, You're wrong, because you know neither Scripture nor the power of God, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given marriage, but are like angels in heaven. As for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He's not God of the dead, but God of the living. When the crowd heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. So coming back to this, right? Coming back to the story, this group called the Sadducees are giving Jesus a ridiculous story. The story is that the person is married to a wife and the person dies and the wife marries again, another husband dies, wife marries again, another husband dies and marries seven times, finally the wife dies, the, the woman dies. What will be the result of resurrection? Who would she be married to? They're trying to mock Jesus and Jesus says, you have no idea what you're talking about. Let me tell you what resurrection is like. Let me tell you what souls are like in heaven. Let me tell you what life is like in eternity. I mean, Jesus has been there, so he can tell people exactly what it's like. So we see what it's like in verse 30. It says this, For in resurrection neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So that's what resurrection is like. We're not going to be married. And some of us look at this and we get nervous, right? It's like, oh man, I hope that I get married before Jesus comes again. <laughs> right? Like, I want to get married. I want to get married before the rapture. I want to get married. No, the reality is you are going to experience everything you experience in earthly marriage and more yeah. in heaven. Right. You know what marriage is? Marriage ultimately is a shadow. A shadow of Christ's love for the church. This is said in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 to 32. Therefore a man shall leave his, uh, leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So it's like, hey, you're going to get married, and you're going to leave your, wife, uh, leave your father and your mother and get married to your spouse. But the reality is that this is actually talking about Christ and the church. Paul is saying, hey, this is actually what it's pointing toward. So everything you're experiencing in this early life, the intimacy, the love, the companionship, the, the good things of marriage, right? Not the bad things, but good things of marriage, which you experience with your companion, is going to be experienced infinitely more when you are in heaven, when Christ embraces you as his bride. The emotion is going to be there. The feelings are going to be You're not going to miss out anything. You could be single, and in the end, we're all going to be experiencing the same thing. You're not going to be... Right? You're not going to lose out on anything. You are going to be experiencing everything that God intended for you to experience in eternity. So that's good news. You don't have to be married. You could be single and you will still experience the goodness of the Lord. Another reason why there's not going to be marriage in heaven is because there's not going to be procreation in heaven. There's going to be fixed amount of redeemed as there are fixed amount of angels. The reason why marriage had to occur on earth is because marriage is the way which families are constructed. So God today is allowing procreation to happen in this world and people are coming to this world through becoming children. And children are to be raised within a family setting. That's God's design. Right? A child is not raised in a family setting is going, to be a, is going to be greatly at a disadvantage. Many of us experience that, right? You raise a child with a mom and dad who are teaching you about Jesus, that child is going to be a lot better off. It's just the way it is. I mean, I mean by God's grace, God can still give grace to the child no matter what, but I'm saying that the construction of the family, the unit of the family is very, very important in the raising of the child. And so what God intended for, for, uh, for this world to be and, 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 and for Christians to participate in marriage so that our children can be raised up in the Lord. That's not going to happen in heaven. There's not going to be procreation. There's going to be fixed amount of redeemed, fixed amount of those who are angels. 
So therefore, there's not going to be need for marriage as there's not going to be need for that family structure which we see here on earth. So here, Christ gave them examples or illustrations to tell them that why there's not going to be marriage in heaven and why their illustration falls away in light of the reality of heaven. The question doesn't even make sense in light of the reality of heaven. However, Jesus now is going to go on attack. See, the Sadducees have been way too long promoting false theology, saying that resurrection is not talked about in the first five books of the Bible. So Jesus says, here's my turn. I'm going to tell you exactly where resurrection is talked about in the first five books of the Bible. He's going to tell them in verse 31 to 32. And this is a quotation from Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, which says, I am, this is God speaking, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He said, where is it coming from? This is my Exodus account. Moses is listening to God being introduced by God to himself, right? Or God is introducing himself to Moses. Telling Moses, hey, it's time for you to follow my command to tell the Israelites to come out of Egypt and go into the promised land. Moses says, well, what should I tell them who sent me? And God begins to introduce himself and says, well, I am, I am, I am. I am the eternal God. I am the God of your father. I am the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. And this is exactly what Jesus is quoting here, which is seen in verse 31 and 32. As for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, God of Jacob. He's not God of the dead, Amen. but God of the living. See, God's not going to introduce himself by someone who's already dead. It makes no sense. God is relevant. Why introduce himself by someone who's already irrelevant? Someone who's already passed away a long time ago. And every single one of these phrases, I am, I am, I am, is in the present tense. In the Greek construct, ego and me, is the present tense. I am currently the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. In the Hebrew language, it has the same drive as well. So God says, I am currently their God. I'm not going to introduce myself by someone who's already dead. It makes no sense. I'm relevant as they're relevant. As they're living, I'm living as well. The interesting part of this is that he introduced himself as the God of Abraham. Here's a, here's a fun part of Greek grammar. The word of is called genitive. Greek grammar is called genitive. Genitive is a, is a, is a connection between two nouns. So genitive can either be subjective or objective. Object means that you take the whatever is, is, is behind the of to be the one that possessed the one that is before, and gen, a subjective will be vice versa. So hang with me here a little bit. So if it's object genitive, it will mean that Jesus, or God is the God who Abraham is embracing, the God that belongs to Abraham. Abraham calls God his God. He's embracing right now Yahweh as his God. If it's objective genitive, it's true. It's subjective genitive, that means that God is a God who's over Abraham. God of Abraham in that sense. I'm over you. I'm of you. Right? I'm God over Abraham. I'm God of Abraham. That's true too. So either way it's true. Either way dictates that God is living as Abraham is living. Or Abraham is living as God is living. See, God gave plenty, plenty of examples of resurrection in the Bible. But perhaps one of the clearest resurrection example which we could see is in our own lives in this world because the way God made this world, He actually made this world to represent what resurrection would be like. He did. A lot of things in this world represent resurrection. You ever thought of the caterpillar and the butterfly? Do you know how the caterpillar goes in the cocoon and it seals itself in the cocoon? You know what happens to the caterpillar? It dissolves. Did you know that? It's not just changing little by little. It completely turns to liquid. It literally turns to liquid, meaning that it, it dies. It's gone. It's not a caterpillar anymore. And it reconstructs into a butterfly. Man. It's beautiful. It's a picture of resurrection, metamorphosis. And you think, well, what's our feeling going to be like when we get resurrected? Well, take the caterpillar example a little further. Say if you're a caterpillar. Imagine you're a caterpillar. You're walking, right, you're crawling along, right? And there's certain dreams that you may have. You might dream that, you know, I want longer legs. I want longer legs. I want more legs, right? So I can crawl a little faster. You might want to 
curl up a little more, so I want longer body, I want bigger, longer bodies, so I can go a little faster. But you know what? After you became a butterfly, you don't care about these things anymore. After you become a butterfly, you fly around, you don't want longer legs, you don't care. You want a longer body, you don't care. Because you are of a different nature, so is our resurrected body. See, in this world, we care about a lot of things. We care about what? Money, fame, success, career, ambition. We care about these things because it's what this world is about. But people ask me, you know, what about resurrection? Are we, you are going to feel so much different than the way you feel in this world. Right. You want to get married in this world, in the resurrected life, you don't even care about attaching yourself to a sinful person. Why? Right? Why do that? Because you are completely Complete resurrect, your resurrected body is going to give you complete different intention, emotion regarding your just just everything. <laughs> okay, and I have no words for it because that's beyond our beyond my thought process. You're just not going to think the same way. You're not. That's the beauty why we look forward to resurrection. Some of you are thinking, oh, I'm going to struggle with sin for the rest of my life. It's like, oh, you know, in reality, if you are going to struggle with sin for the rest of your life, but that's not going to happen in eternity. In fact, you're going to feel so different so different about sin and about temptation that your thought process will be so focused on God that you won't even want the things which you want in this world anymore. Some people think about, you know, like, what about my family members that get saved? And I'm going to be sad with sad for them for eternity? No, you're not. You're not going to be thinking like that anymore. In fact, in the book of Revelation, when sinners are judged, the saints are praising God while the sinners are judged. That means our family members, the people we feel so deeply for right now, for the salvation, that's going to only be on this world. Sometime in heaven, we're going to be feeling so different. We're not going to... When people are judged, no matter who they are, we're going to be, so, we're going to be focusing on the glory of God in that day. It's hard for us to comprehend right now, Right? But eternity is going to be the reality because we are going to be transformed. We're going to be different. Amen. We're going to feel differently the way we feel today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 to 52 says this. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable, this mortal body must put on immortality. See, our bodies are going to be changed. What is perishable will put on imperishable. What is, immo- what is mortal will be immortal. Will be completely different. So what does it tell us? It tells us to live for Christ today. To live for Jesus today. Now, if there's no resurrection, then it makes sense that we don't live for Jesus because even Paul himself said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 32. says this, If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. See, if there's no resurrection, we can just eat and drink and tomorrow we die. It doesn't matter. So those people who are eating and drinking and, and, and living their lives for pleasure only hedonistically, in that sense, they're the ones who are most making sense in this world if resurrection don't exist. But resurrection does exist because God has already given to each one of us evidence of the resurrection. You know what's the greatest evidence of resurrection for you and for me? It's in our hearts. In our hearts. The Second Corinthians chapter, I think two, talks about the Holy Spirit being a seal, an engagement ring, literally, saying that God will complete what He started. Yes. What has He started? John chapter three verse five. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. So what God started? God started by putting His Holy Spirit within you. See, this is the evidence of our resurrection because our souls, our, our souls, our mind has already been resurrected. We're just waiting for the resurrection of our bodies. Our souls have been resurrected. How does that evidence the resurrection? Well, you know that you're not going to be the person that you are today unless God has done something in your life, right? There's no way that you could be sitting here at this church given what you've done in the past. No way. So why are you here? It's because God has resurrected your soul and caused you to be a different person. You have the greatest evidence of resurrection. Romans chapter 8, verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit within you, telling you, 
because of the way that you're living your life and your desires for God is telling you that you're a child of God. Unless you're a child of God, there's no way you'll feel the way that you feel. Somebody has asked the question, like, well, what if, what if I sin? What if I continue to sin? That's the reality for each one of us while we're here in this world. In Romans chapter 7, verse 25, and just give a brief theo- theological lesson, which I did this morning in Sunday school, it says this, I myself, this time for each one of us, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. See, our minds, our hearts, and our soul has been resurrected, but our flesh has not. It's still waiting for a resurrection. Our flesh has input into our mind, our soul, tempting our mind, tempting our souls to do things, or to, con- to the, tempting the control center to do things that are against God. It's called temptation. It's called sin. And that's what we still sin. We see a battle within each one of us. Our mind serve the law of God, but our flesh serve the law of sin. It's the reality for each one of us, no matter how mature we become in Christ. As long as you're on you this side of the eternity, you're going to be tempted to sin. That's just the reality. So, but what is our battle? Our battle is fight against sin. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11, Peter gives this encouragement to believers, saying, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and as exiles abstain from the passions of the flesh which war wage against your soul. Abstain from the passions of the flesh. Recognize that there is something that is tempting you and withdraw yourself from that temptation or withdraw yourself from that sin. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Amen. Amen. For the desire of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desire of the Spirit are against the flesh. Those are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. So we're going to be in this fight. And this fight is only accomplished, and we can only win this fight by trusting in the Holy Spirit. By depending upon the Holy Spirit, we can never ever get arrogant because the fight was not over. Some people think, oh, no, as I get older, hopefully I won't just won't be tempted anymore. You will continue to be tempted. Some of the sins that you're tempted today will be temptation for you 30, 40 years now. It can come back or it become less, but you still be a temptation. Or you'll be tempted by other things. You will experience temptation. The only way that you can triumph over temptation is by completely trusting the Holy Spirit and not your experience or your own righteousness. So you must continue to trust in the Holy Spirit. Pray, ask for the Spirit to continue to fill you so that you can live for the glory of God. The good news, good news is that this battle will end one day. See, if we continue to struggle, struggle is hard, right? Struggle with sin is hard. Struggle against sin is very, very difficult. But that struggle will end one day. It will. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. See, we're going to be made completely like Jesus Christ. The things that we feel today, the temptation we feel today, I talked about this, the emotions that we feel today, the struggles we feel today, are not going to be the things which you feel in eternity. Just not. You're going to feel your, the worship, the, the praise, the awe, desire to honor Christ, desire to, to, to give it all for Christ. The, the, that feeling is going to be accentuated an infinite amount in eternity. That is going to be the overwhelming passion, emotion of your life, while the sinful tendencies are going to just go away. We're going to be living according to how God wants to live, and we're going to be passionate living for it, and that's the good news. That's the good news. So here we see the certainty of resurrection, right? We see the challenge to resurrection. The world challenges resurrection, but we also saw the Word of God affirming resurrection. Now, everybody eventually had to face up to their own resurrection, whether it be resurrecting to life or resurrecting toward everlasting damnation. Everybody does. There's one man, his name is Voltaire. We talked about him a little bit in the beginning of the sermon. He's a Enlightenment thinker, much like Thomas Jefferson and many of the people who are the founding fathers of our country, they simply like taking Christian principles, right? Christian principles from the Bible to create a government, but many of the people don't have an actual relationship with God. They don't. That's the honest truth. They don't believe in God. Voltaire cursed God. Right? They, they're deists. They believe the Christian principles, but they don't want an actual relationship with Jesus. Mocked God. Criticized God. 
Thomas Jefferson took out much of the Bible. It's called Thomas, Thomas Jefferson Bible. Took out all the miracles. Voltaire, Thomas Jefferson, and people like them, they don't believe in the resurrection. They just believe that you're just going to die and you're just going to dissipate and disappear in the rest of the world. So Voltaire, this is recorded by the end of his life, while he was suffering from this agony of death, and people couldn't approach him because he was in such agony, he was screaming and crying, said this, I must die, abandoned by God and men, Jesus. To the physician next to him, he said this, I'm abandoned by God and man. I will give you half what I'm worth if you give me six months to live. He's talking to the physician next to him. Then I will go to hell and you will go with me. Oh Christ, oh Jesus Christ. Cursing God to the end. Admitting that he's going to hell and he's going to take his physician with him. A man who did not believe in resurrection. A man who thought that he has it all. He is not going to face any kind of eternity. Came to the reality of the fact that he will face eternity as eternity of hell. The truth is that each one of us believe eternity exists. Yeah. Romans chapter 1 says that we have to suppress that in our hearts if we don't know the Lord Jesus. Don't suppress it. God has built eternity in yeah. your heart. He's laid out clearly, clearly how to get there through the Son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. If you believe unto him, you will be saved. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you for this wonderful reminder of eternity. Wonderful reminder of the resurrection. We know, Lord, that you have sent the Son, Jesus Christ, to come to earth to give us this resurrection. Help us, God, to embrace you. We know that perhaps there are people here who have not embraced the Lord Jesus. Open our hearts now. Bring us to a state of worship. Let us focus. Let us come to terms with the reality which we have been avoiding, which is what will we be and what, where will we be in eternity. Help us, Lord, to know for certain that we will be with you. And that can only be done through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord. Convict us, Lord, Holy Spirit. Convict us. Holy Spirit, put your spirit in each one of our hearts, even in the hearts of those who do not know you this morning. Make us born again, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.